What up? Picking up where we left off last time. We have our basic calculator app. Um, very basic. So I'm going to go ahead and run that. And we'll say 5 plus uh, 11, 16. It loops now. 4.4, or let's do 0.1 plus. 2.3 okay so we hit control C and that will break out of that we'll go back over here so anyway um, you can see it's basically has like an input section and then it has a processing section that has an interwoven output section and that's in a nutshell that's what computer programs are input processing output loop and so I'm just gonna go through here that's sort of like also if you think of like um, I'm not trying to get into crazy architectural discussions like um, traditional architectural like MVC patterns and stuff like that but that's kind of even with those things I don't even I don't even think those are essential they're sort of like abstractions like id, ego, super ego, like the Freudian abstractions. There's a lot of things I disagree with Freud on. Um, I think that id, ego, super ego, I could argue against that like forever in a day, but you, I use those abstractions all the time. Like it just, it just works to break things up into those three conceptual abstractions. Like I can do that all day, all long, and it works. And uh, anyway, that's kind of like the way I see model view controller was just, that was sort of the, what it was phrased back in the 70s or 80s or whatever and they people have just sort of said hey and they just say that and they sort of bend it to fit their need or whatever so a traditional model view controller if you look at that model you're like you want to add in extra lines to it if you do that it it will just be like there'll be missing communication lines and everybody if you ask 10 different people it's you get at least 10 slightly different stories so it, it boils down to input processing and output back in the model view controller days of the more traditional like unified form of it I guess you could say like the small talk form of it maybe um, that's when I knew input processing output that was like I didn't I wasn't hip to the OO crowd stuff yet so the input processing output is kind of like the even lower level crowd. So the MVC is sort of like the high level crowd putting that as one of several possible abstractions. <clears throat> and honestly, I think I like identify better with model view presenter maybe if any of those, but forget about all that. That is complexity. Having to think about all that is complexity. This is my simplistic approach to, um, the incremental development and with the emergent architecture and I basically I was thinking you know what it's a simple handed path that's the way like instead of like a left handed or a right handed path or whatever um, think of it like you're navigating it by saying I'm going to take the simple fork in the road every time I get somewhere so that's what it is and by doing that there's like virtually no waste um, the rework is there's virtually no rework it's absolutely minimized so refactoring isn't necessarily rework refactoring is when you take this code and we kind of shift it around but we change the shape of it but we don't really change it from like the user the the next user's perspective or whatever they're still you know for the most part it operates the same to them so anyway that's where we're at right here so I'm just gonna kind of start combing through this we've we've produced this it has its it gets its input it comes over here it processes it and then it does a little bit of additional processing right here and then it finally outputs it so we have to kind of line it up with what I was saying is that basically um, for input processing output is like the the basic abstraction to use for how we need to start breaking up our architecture as soon as we start needing to break it up and to put it in a like a more practical sense like a hypothetical sense um, let's say that all of a sudden we turn this in we turned in our stupid little calculator right here and to the stakeholders and they looked at it and they're like wow 
you know, if this was like 1975, this would be all right. But this is just ridiculous. Like I thought we're going to have, we expect this, like they're expecting something like this, you know, at least. So they just want to know what's going on. When are we going to get this? When's it going to be done? You know, the typical things, high level business concerns instead of like respecting what all the stuff we have to do maybe, but, um, so we need to step it up. So looking at this, it's like, okay, we have the console interface, which is really just our testing interface. We told them that, but they don't seem to understand that, you know, that things will get better. So here and now we thought that maybe we were going to add, let's say that we were going to add more operators to our thing. Like we we're going to add square root and stuff like that, and maybe align it better with how the calculator actually works. But that's not the next priority. You know, we don't pick that in an agile, modern agile development system. The product owners who basically represent the stakeholders are, they're going to prioritize that backlog and it's going to say, Hey, number one, front and center, we want a GUI next increment. So that being said, and the fact that we talked about how, um, in the last video, how test driven development was also missing. You'll see right now that all that stuff's going to go hand in hand. But first, I'm going to comb through it real quick. Remember, input, processing, output. That's what we want to separate those concerns, at least those concerns. In the future, you want to separate even business concerns more. But just as that general simplistic view, to put it into perspective, that's where I'm going today. Um, so I'm just going to comb through a few of these little notes I had. So it doesn't loop while function which I did go ahead and tack on this loop. Um, I did the quick and dirty method. I'm going to make it slightly more correct for the language. And there's a change right there. I mean, honestly, that change right there, if you uh, commit to most open source projects, they're going to want that as its own individual commit because they don't want that thrown in with like, if I do something with this input block or something, whatever. Um, and then I'm like, hey, while I'm here, I'm going to do that whole scout thing and clean up. They get pissed about that. So what you want to do is that's sort of its own as trivial as it seems it's like that's its own thing it's like okay there's that that's a commit save it and test and run it you know um, right now we're still doing manual testing so that's not really and I hit control C to break out of it right there but it looks like that loops working at least um, so that's that then we can come down here let's just trickle off our little issue list so doesn't loop and while wow func we got that okay so function is the next thing and i put that there kind of as a reminder um what i was just speaking about about separating those the input processing output concerns so this right here is getting nasty this is like the biggest heaviest chunk of code we have so far and what is that? You know, what if I was wanting to tack a comment right above this block of code right here and I wanted to say like what it was, what is it doing? Why do we care about this? Why don't I just delete it? You know, so um, looking at that and if I look down this conditional, it's saying, you know, if the operator compares to addition, a plus, then do this addition. And when you do that, add the two numbers and then format them according to this uh, symbolic constant, which will basically just is like a search and replace. It will put this right here. Um, so this is saying format to eight decimal places with no extra zeros and then print it. So print. So what we have right here is we have our, our inputs. We have processing processing uh, which is a comparison process right here and then we have you can just look at the operators to see what kind of process it is and right here we have an expression processing and right here we have string processing which this kind of that helps signify right there that's um the python 2 format specifier operator for strings so anyway and then finally we have our output right there so these are interwoven and that's bad right now it's not a big deal and that's why we did it like that it's like it's quick and dirty and it it uh showed us what we wanted to see like hey can we even begin to make this calculator app a real thing um we got a 
we got to throw some something out there you know we got to throw some ink on the canvas so that's what that is so what we're going to do is we're going to push this big chunk out to a function because it's more than a screen full anytime you have more than a screen full of something that's a flag right there that's a smell it's like what can I do to like get this within a screen so I can read it because if I scroll down here I might forget like oh yeah what were my input variables oh there they are up there you know so anyway in more whatever IDEs you're gonna like more capital IDEs you're gonna find a thing where you could just do this and like right click and say like extract function or something like that right big whoop um, what I'm gonna do is this is just whatever you know I'm just gonna come here you can just hit control X on a lot of computers to cut I'm gonna cut that out and then right here I'm gonna define a function and what I should have done I'll hit control Z a couple times to put it back is what is this doing okay it's there's the operator it's comparing what the operator is so I'm just gonna call it operate right um, control shift C a couple times so we'll call it operate that's what the comment I would have put it like operate on numbers you know I would have had a comment like that so we'll just call it operate and then for right now I won't even put the variables in we'll come down here and we'll paste it in so what's going on here is um it got the okay that is the right intention so just double check the indention if you paste so now we have it all in an operate function and if we run it it will um, get the inputs and then that will be it I'll go ahead and save it and run it so I'll save control s and then f5 to run and 5 uh, minus 10 and it's just back to an inner number I'm gonna hit control C so what's going on is it's just looping through this right here and that's it and then it defines a function but it never gets called so we need to actually call that function so while true and this is right where it was we were supposed to replace it oops I'll save and run that 5 plus 5 hmm name operate is invalid so let's go back over there what happened was we declared this function below so it hasn't even parsed the file that far yet so we'll go ahead and which is typical I kind of knew that would happen but I just want to go ahead and illustrate it so what we're doing now is we're defining the function at the top of the file when the parser um, Python and a lot of scripting is top down left to right so when it comes in it's gonna start processing this file from the top down from left to right and once it gets to something if it asks for like user input like ours did it's going to stop control s to save right there and it's going to stop and um do that you know so if it hasn't parsed in some function that's defined at the bottom of the file yet then that function doesn't exist to it yet so anyway we just basically moved all this out into the operator function all that logic it could be pushed out to another file and i'm not doing that yet intentionally I say keep a few screenfuls um, in the first file initially, you know. But once it gets beyond that, once it's like this in and of itself is multiple screenfuls, then it's like, okay, yeah, we definitely need to think about pushing that out for sure. Um, so this is basically the main code now, and this is the single function in there. I shouldn't really have lost anybody yet, I wouldn't think. Don't read too much into all these. These are just reminders. I'm going to go over each one of them. Um, so now we have our input and this is our processing and output in one function so that's the next smell so we got rid of the function which is cool save that um, but the processing and output are still tied together those concerns right here print decimal places da, 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 da. so if we look at this when we come in there's processing there's processing there's processing it's processing for output but it's still just processing it's still just a string it hasn't been outputted yet but right here is where we get dirty and we're outputting so that's what we need to fix so the quick and easy win on here is just to go back up and do just call this like result 
you know what I mean and just literally just replace all these with result um, we'll just drop that string into a variable instead of um, immediately printing it because what if we want to use a graphical interface versus a you know the console that we have been using oops so that's what we're gonna do could even use the text replace stuff in the in most text editors to even speed that up and save that and okay then we have one more print statement right here so otherwise that result string is gonna get that string all right and we realize that this down here is the main that's it's just sort of the background code which automatically every time this files loaded into a Python interpreter that background code um, from here down you know it will parse this it will say hey there's a function called that right and then it will come down here and it will actually run I'll execute all of that code like note for note okay so anyway this is taking that result so then at the very bottom we have operate we're not taking that's a flag right there we forgot to um, but then when we get down here we're gonna leave a blank line to break from that block of code for sure even though we have the extra blanks in there for readability which are questionable but we definitely want at least one extra blank line below it to break from that block and then we're gonna return that result and so now down here this our operate command is only processing now so that's beautiful and so since it's only processing there's no output so we can even say we can call it result here too this is a different result than the one up there and those are different num a's and num b's because they shadow over these ones are more like um they're basically globals because they're in that background area of this file so their their scope is throughout the whole file but as soon as we come in here um, right now technically these are globals too they're calling on those globals so let's run it um, then we need our output so well let's run it just make sure we don't get any errors five and of course this isn't thorough testing that's like one-off testing you know that's like um, it's ridiculous so yeah there's still no output which was expected so what I'm gonna do down here is I'm gonna say um, print and then I could say result and run that with that five do five divided by five we get one cool okay so that's working again so that's how easy that is and if we wanted to really we could even just say like print that just to keep it really simple and uh, f5 to run that and then do oops uh, operator so six um, enter number six operator minus 14.6 8.6 all right control C to break out of that um, so that's shortcutting that I want to cover these real quick these are the bare essentials right here this is sort of like my guiding principles that I'm keeping in mind as I go through all of this code and whatnot um, so right here number one first and foremost is keep it stupid simple that's what I'm going for that's why I've chosen to push this stuff off into its own function and not to do individual little functions maybe for each one of these right now if we taken the test driven development approach that is likely that we would have done individual little functions for those um, it depends and we still can adapt it to test driven without going that granular but that is kind of one of the cool things about test driven development is it sort of like leapfrog steps you um, guide you through the architectural principles but right now we're going off experience we're doing that the simple handed path rule so what we want to do here is um, see how this applies to the KISS principle obviously so it's just the simplest the simplest change we could have made was to just copy and paste that into a single function um, one of the things I was forgetting to do that I'm gonna do now 
okay, so how I had said it was relying on the globals. So these are effectively global variables, and then it's coming in here, and that it's relying on that global state. That's a bad practice. And as you can see, that was the simplest thing, but that's an immediate smell right there, as I have globals. And these are things that look more like, once you're an experienced programmer, these look a lot more like local variables. They don't look global at all. They don't have long global names. Um, Globals, in my opinion, should be multi-word names. So that's bad. So what we really should be doing is we should be passing those in, like um, num a operator and then num b, like something like that, right? And then even though it seems redundant, it's just, it's so much, it's such a small change. And in the long run, it or even in the shorter run, Oftentimes it will be way better practice. So right there, that's all we had to do. And now they're not globals. So I'm passing those in right there, but I'm trying to think if there's a good way to, it's not really a good way to put it right now. But anyway, so let's try and run it. Saved it and hit F5, 5 plus 7. 12, everything seems to be working, at least from that stupid little test. So uh, that got rid of the global issue right there, so that's cool. Sorry, I'm kind of bouncing around on this. So in this deal right here, so that's the keep it simple thing. Um, What else do we have going on here do simple first that is just that's one I made up I think I've heard that somewhere before um, I know people probably say that to some degree and it's really just a reiteration of keep it simple um, but do simple first do it like keep it simple realize that's the first rule so do that that's why we extract everything into one big function instead of a bunch of little functions because it's way easier to wrap it with this one def statement and indent the whole block together just like we did than it is to go in and put a bunch of def blocks, pull all this out, you know, whatever. If we need to do that, if we need to get that granular, we can. And by creating this this level of abstraction right here, we can do that within that level of abstraction. So now we don't have to um, to go back out here. Like this stuff will never have to change. Like this, that statement, once that does, eventually if this program grows enough, propagates out to its own file or whatever, um, it won't have to change if this stuff changes as long as we continue to implement that interface right there and we could still get granular we could still put these into little functions and that's still three layers to the solution from the question kind of thing which is ideal to not have to go any more layers of abstraction deep than that to sort of have to get like some sort of a concrete answer but anyway that's just you know I'm I'm just saying the same thing over and over slightly different basically I'm not trying to be like complicated and over wordy dry don't repeat yourself um, we haven't repeated ourselves yet we haven't deleted and rewritten code which is repeating ourselves that's stretching that that whole principle a little bit I think but that's key um, principle of least astonishment these are just extras but they come down to just like keep it simple again that one's just reiterating the keep it simple like in the sense of like when I come in and look at this you know is this astonishing is this trying to be like clever is everything all on one line or something you know like or is everything sandwiched together like do whatever seems reasonable for the context and then Yagni is also all these everything builds off of keep it simple and so this is you ain't gonna need it you aren't gonna need it however you want to say it and that's saying like why don't I factor this out into some design, quote unquote, design pattern or something like that right now? Because, you know, there's a 90% chance I'm going to need that. I don't need it yet. You know, who knows this project might get thrown out tomorrow. Like, even if it did sustain and this project comes to total fruition, it, um, it might not make it that far. So that's the whole thing is we're like minimizing risk and cost and resources and all that right now. We're not... We're not even thinking into it quite as much as maybe I'm even saying right now, but close to it, you know, and only this much is kind of the idea I'm going for. Um, so basically everything, everything's built off of that kiss principle. 
is just keep it stupid simple. Do whatever you got to do to keep it stupid simple. That's how you build empirical evidence. Empirical evidence is evidence based on experience, um, technically. So do these little baby steps. Just like when you're doing complicated math problems and the teacher's like, work it out. You know, let me see your work on the paper. It's, yeah, you might be able to do those in your head by forcing yourself to work it out. You're just like reinstilling that. You know, that's whatever benefits there are to rote learning. That's what that's going to do. So do it once, you know, like I'm doing right now. Like if nothing else, like I'm getting a lot out of this just by doing this. I'm going and researching way far out and around all this just to make sure I'm not forgetting anything that's, you know, I'm digging in complexities that don't even necessarily directly apply to this in my opinion, but I'm just trying to make sure that I'm up on all of this. So anyway, then there's solid. Um, some people argue this only applies to object oriented programming. I think that's not true at all for the most part. Um, there's certain specifics about it, a few little specifics that would for the most part apply specifically to object oriented programming. But the gist of this I use it all the time. There's other things that complement and overlap all this kind of stuff, you know, and you can dig into those. There's a Wikipedia page on, I think it's programming patterns or uh, programming principles. That's what this is. These principles are what drive patterns. So this is solid and it's basically like helping in the object sense of like sort of compartmentalizing stuff. So uh, the S stands for single responsibility principle and I mean, the names of these things are the most complex part of them. It's really simpler than that. It just means one reason to change. Like any conceptual chunk of your program at whatever abstraction level, because you know there's a high level like business, executive level abstraction, so to speak. And then there's various layers below that all the way down to, you know, close to bare metal technically. But um whatever level you're at and you're speaking in within that component within that module within that unit you want it to have like one major responsibility um one concern one business concern and that's it that's the only reason it should change what we've kind of done here is we said that those concerns right now we're keeping them at like the imperative level and saying you know input processing output um whatever i don't mean to get too technical with like business level concerns versus whatever logic concerns but um whatever major concerns you know that there are like that are you don't want something to change because like somebody is using a desktop computer instead of a mobile phone for example right so whether or not they're using one of what device they're using that's one concern that shouldn't be tied to the processing of like a payroll formula or something like that. Like that payroll formula should not care what type of device that this person's looking at. So that boils all the way down to our component level within our low level architecture too in our code. Um, because we want to be able to kind of like bind those pieces, those components, we want to bind them to their physical real world components and sort of have them float off with those things and that sort of a thing. So anyway, that's what that first S is, is it's that separation of concerns, that single responsibility A class is bound to only one aspect of a specification on more of like the business level or whatever. Um, only one business reason to change. And then the second one is open closed principle. So the open closed principle is that it's open for extension, but closed for modification. So right here, this is literally our, basically our only um, interface we have right here, which this open closed principle would apply to. And what we have is we, now that we've created this, I mean, yeah, we have a couple internal iterations maybe before it goes like public, but once it does go out to a customer or the public so to speak on any level we want to be pretty solid with this like if we're going to change this we're going to have to say hey here comes version two of our api right and then everybody's going to have to say hey you got to switch to it by this date and blah, all that crap you've seen if you've used like those web apis the restful so-called interfaces um so what this is is we we don't want this interface to change we want to always maybe we want to be able to add like 
another variable there or something later in the future, which is totally fine. Um, but we always want to provide this so that if anybody makes that call, this is indefinitely there for as far as reasonably possible. And uh, so w this is something to check this interface that we just pulled out over here against. And it's like, hey, this seems pretty fair. Like you have a number A, you have an operator and a number B. Uh, one thing I was thinking when I looked over the calculator a little bit more specifically is that like if I do a 5 plus, it's technically giving me a 0 plus 5 there. And then I do a 6 plus, now it's giving me the plus 5 plus the previous value, plus 3 plus. So anyway, we're not there yet, but that's just something to think about. Um, so this interface, like... Uh, it's probably not perfect, just like most interfaces is, but it seems all right. It seems to do the trick, you know, so we can put it there. And even if we end up saying, you know what, forget that interface. That was so wrong. We could cut all this out and stuff it, break it up, stuff it into um, what they call decomposition, right? That's breaking it up into some other interfaces and then have this interface call those ones and still maintain this stupid historical interface regardless. So... I'm going way out and beyond right now, but this is what I'm trying to project is that how this type of thinking and architecting scales. So that's the open for extension, close for modification principle. Then right here we have the Liskov substitution principle, which is um, definitely leaning more towards object oriented specific. Liskov sounds scary. It sounds like, whoa, here's this like brilliant person that came up with some formula that's just like you know they could probably do a whole college course around or something um well for one thing i feel like it should have the first name because it's a woman so speaking of how there's all that propaganda about how there's supposedly lacking women in tech women have brought us the best concepts in tech ever period um at least as many women as men or at least as many uh concepts as the men have so what barbara liskov's substitution principle is which of course that's the most complex sounding thing of it it's really simple is just saying if you have like a base type a base class like general class then if you have a specific a specific class like less general more specific so if you had like a uh, screen class like a display class right and then you had one that's like mobile display more specific right and the the display class is like the general one well anywhere you could send that um, that general display class you should be able to send that specific mobile class that mobile screen class so that boils down to just interfaces and that's something I'm going to get into more later but um it's also really simple you just take i mean it's just so simple and when you take that approach which a lot of half or more of the object oriented languages don't cater towards um it's a lot easier it's so much easier but anyway specialized type can take the place of a general type that's all that is and that's not even something to worry about right now so the interface segregation principle which is what i was kind of getting into um is just to break it up so if you basically think of like a universal remote control for a television set and like a dvd player maybe you're cool and you have a laser disc player still or vcr or something and you can have all those operations right well you don't want to hand everybody that comes over maybe the remote control for everything in your house like even if you have one big universal remote that does everything so the idea is is that you can have because that's what an interface is. It's a lot like a television remote control or something. Um, and you want it to be as simple as possible. Like, what what do you care about? You know, I only care about channel and volume, right? So just give somebody who only cares about that, that control. And then you don't have to worry about them flipping the lights on in the other room or something. Like, trying to change the channel. And it's just, it's way easier. But then the way that software interfaces work is you can connect them together. Like if you think if you had like 15 different remotes maybe in your house and you could click them all together in whatever fashion you wanted, that's how software interfaces work. And that's what the segregation thing's about is knowing that you can click all those remotes together and be like, oh, here you want to work channels, volume, and the laser player? 
click those two remotes together and hand them to that person, you know, and then they just have that control and that's all they care about and it's a beautiful thing. So anyway, that's something to consider in object oriented or, you know, not even object oriented necessarily, but especially in object oriented programming. Um, and dependency inversion is depend on abstractions, not on concrete implementations, which these just serve to reinforce the one right before it basically with a lot of this stuff. Uh, so this is basically saying depend on these interfaces because technically in software an interface is abstract. An interface is saying you have that remote that tells you how you can change that channel, but you don't know how it's changing behind. You don't know what the electronics are involved. or You don't even necessarily know. I mean, if it's a really good heavy duty remote, you know, functioning really well, you might point it behind your back instead of towards the TV. And it still changes it. And you're like, whoa, how did it do that? I heard there's like a little light signal that comes, an invisible light signal off the front, but I was pointing it behind my back, you know, so you don't even know. It's like, is this radio control or what? Like, all you care about is that it works. If you pick it up and it works, that's what, depending on abstractions, is, is that's an abstraction that just says, you don't care if this is radio controlled. You don't care if it's on your smartphone and it works over Wi-Fi controlled to change your TV channel. Just that it that it does that, and uh, I mean, you could probably just imagine what a beautiful thing that is, because then you can just switch out so much stuff. Because that little shim, that little like that little piece of paper in between those two devices that says this is how you'll work. You know, there's like the remote itself is basically that piece of paper. Because it says, hey, you know, um, the interface is the remote without batteries in it. And then the implementation is once you stuff those batteries in there and give it that power. That's not a one-to-one -one comparison, but that's just a little general, like, happy feeling comparison to it. It's like the interface is that spec where you can look at it and go, you know, if you pick up the remote, if it's like laying down at a thrift store or something, you pick it up and you're like, oh, I, I like this remote. I can kind of see how it works, even though you're not using it yet. But once you put the batteries in and power everything up and juice up the implementation specific circuits, which you don't care about, all you care about is that those circuits work, right? And then one other quick comparison is to an automobile. Uh, if you're driving a car, whether it's gas powered, electric powered, steam powered, whatever, you get in a vehicle, most cars you expect like a steering wheel, maybe a gear shifter, um, a brake pedal and a gas pedal, like at the very least. So you can operate any car like that. You can, like, you can operate any automatic transmission vehicle for the most part like that, so to speak, or, you know, within reason. So that's your interface. That right there is your interface, and the implementation behind it is whatever. So this is our interface, is operate on a number, on two numbers with an operator. Um, it might not be the best interface right now, but that's what we're going for. This is basically our main program. Um, it still has a lot of smells in it. I'm gonna go ahead and hide this. We're focusing on keep it simple and dry and do simple first. Okay, so try and wrap this up within a reasonable time here. So too many reasons to change. Okay, let's see if those reasons are still there. Okay, this doesn't have to, this is just processing. So in this early of a phase that has no extra reasons to change. This is basically sort of autonomous, so to speak. It like we could picture this operator where basically, you know, it's almost like an operator. Like it, um, it's almost like a little gadget on its own, which is cool. That's what we want to go for. Um, the idea with object-oriented programming, especially, is to there's supposed to be sort of independent systems that can get hooked together in like a very reusable fashion. Um, so too many reasons to change. Does this have reasons to change? So this is our input. And this specific input right here is getting input from a console. So that has to change if we get input from a GUI. Converting it to a float, we would probably, like I said in the video before, your inputs usually in most programming situations is going to be a string coming in. So you will want to parse a float out of that. Um, in this particular situation and you will so that right there needs to be separate from this input so we need to pull this input out into another 
another deal. So that's still a flag there. Um, but what we can do right now Okay, so a quick answer to this would be to go ahead and just plug this into its own function. def um, console input get console input. I'll just do a quick and dirty method. And then I'll come down here and tab all this over, or just tab that over. And I'll bring this back out here save it so now this get console input if we call that it will loop continually which I don't want in here um, and it's going to take care of all that stuff so literally we can just add that right here so get console input we can call that and then it's going to get those values. So we kind of want those values back, right? Because we want to pass them into this, um, this operator function. So one thing I kind of forgot to do was this right here, <laughs> um, this kind of more of an initialization thing for the whole program. Cause if you think about the calculator, it's eight decimal places. So I'm going to cut that out and hit control home to go to the top of the file. And I'm just going to paste that right there and save it. So, and this is a symbolic constant. So the idea is, is that it shouldn't change. It's sort of like almost could be pushed out to a configuration file in the future if need be. And, and maybe just like an eight, not all the extra formatting. And then we come in and parse the config file and plug in that eight and, hide all that behind a function and maybe you could see how that might expand out if not don't think about that too much but for now um we're keeping all this in a single file for now keeping it simple number one principle and that's a global configuration doesn't change so the one bad thing about globally accessible values like that is that worrying about the biggest thing is worrying about them changing and so the idea is, is that this one shouldn't change and it's at the very front center beginning of the file and it's there as a convenience, it's keeping things, it's making them extra simple to where we can change it in one place right then and there. So that's how I dequalify any sort of smells around that thing. And that got it out of this input thing because we don't want globals inside, you know, especially like defining anything global like that. Like we don't want to alter a global value in there. Um, save that again. Okay. So this get console input will come in here. That looks like a little bit too many. It probably still would have worked, but as long as you're consistently too many or too less. So then like we said in here, we come in here. It's still for now, it's still parsing the float. Um, that's a step that we'll need most likely to get phased out, but I'm just going to leave it in there because honestly, it's the laziness in me telling me to leave it in there right now. And because I haven't thought it out, I'm like, oh, I might not do it ideally or something if I factor it out right now. So I think it serves as a good situation for, like, that can be in the next commit or something. And each one of these, like, extract functions should really probably be in their own commit if you were committing to a revision control system. Um, so this is going to call the get console input. It's going to get those values one option would be if we were doing like an object oriented thing would be pit those on like the instance or the class or whatever. Um, or we could of course pit them out here as globals, but then we're changing globals from within a function. That's a smell that that's a thing where it may seem like the easiest thing right here. I didn't sort of plan that one out. So, but that, that would not be the ideal way to do it. Somehow we want to return all of these values, honestly. Um, so one thing to do would be to pass them in just like we have here. But if we pass them in, we're effectively, I'm just going to kind of cut past the chase on this and say a list or an object. Um, you need to bundle the values together when you start, especially when you want to return more than one value. Um, you have the choice of either passing a pointer to the value or reference to that value, not not actually passing in the value itself, because when you do that, you usually pass in a copy of the value. And then you edit it, 
and unless you return that specific copy that edit gets lost on that value so um, unless it's a global right so we don't want to do the global we don't want the value to get lost and um, you know if we were to pass in a reference to it that's kind of like that's heavy weight to pass in like three references to like three primitives or not even I mean in Python these are technically objects but um, you know the way we usually think in this level of programming is those are primitives they're not like heavyweight objects they're just like the simplest possible scalar values so um, or actually these ones arguably aren't primitives because they're a sequence type but a lot of documentation will misrefer to them as primitives and that works for the context of what we're talking about right now um, so anyway you got to bundle them together is the trick if you need to return multiple values and that's an issue wrap them together and if you're going for the object oriented approach the most pure object oriented approach is to wrap them in an object um, the simple old school approach is to wrap them in a list so uh, you know and you could even think of it honestly like a Python list is an object so it's do you want this boilerplate object or do you want to create a custom object it comes down to things like that so what we will do is we'll get the console input and we will return them as what I haven't really thought this out now I'm want to scratch my head for like a solid day and think of this <laughs> as what how I want to return these as a list or an object so we'll go ahead and return it as an object no as a list because a list is easier to make so there's two choices I'm thinking really simply and generically I'm actually really out of practice with Python which I'm kinda happy about because that makes me keep it um, sort of like this really general common style instead of like getting really idiomatic really Pythonic with the language like I probably should if I was a quote unquote Python programmer but um, anyway I'm just gonna do a list because then I don't have to create a class or anything to like objects are just so heavyweight and I think honestly the best thing to do is avoid them um, to always consider them but if their complexity is too huge like right now to just go over and do an entire class just for this little section doesn't make sense so we're gonna fall back on the list idea and we'll just call it result because it's coming back from a function there's probably way better names to name it but for now and um, just create a little bracket of list like that and then we can change this you know what I'll go ahead and do a dictionary I didn't want to do a dictionary because they're it's slightly complex just in case anybody's too beginner watching this but it's basically an associative array it's an array where the numbers you're not only going by numeric index um, necessarily and actually usually not you're going by like a string name so we'll do that in curly braces which could be a dictionary or a set I think that's a set in Python so maybe I need to return it specifically a dictionary okay and then I can just say that like uh, result and then num a and I can just do it kind of like a and after I'm done recording this I'll probably think like why did I even do it like that like there's a way better way or something but anyway and if so good because I don't necessarily even want to do it the best way right now I want to be able to go back and make changes but this is reasonably sound for now so we create a dictionary um, and for so there'll be a num a value in it and if we you know basically instead of doing this assignment right here if we just call this without the assignment like within a print statement then it will go in and give us that number that was in, entered at this prompt right here that's the idea so then when we get all done we can just say hey return that dictionary return that result I should actually call it results plural whenever you have a any kind of container type like that it's always a good idea to be because it is it's three results right so we're gonna return those results um, and we need to store those somewhere so get console input 
and then we can just even call that in or whatever we want. Um, that's kind of a short name. I'd be a little bit against that normally, but like I said on the previous video, I'm just kind of trying to make myself lean a little bit towards the short names for now. And that's the cool thing too, is once you get into these functions, is that you can get as verbose or light with the naming or however you feel comfortable with it. So if in here, if I was like, you know what, I really, I want to call this operator. I could, I could change that to operator. I'd have to change it up here, of course, too, but that's fine. You know, I could change that name or if out here, maybe it was different. Like if I was like, you know what, I'd rather just call this one operator, um, then I could do that. But speaking of that, now we know what we're getting back is um, our results. So we're getting back that input, that user input. And we're going to operate on that input. So I'm going to save F5 to run it. Invalid. Oh, in's a key word. It turned orange in this editor, so that should have showed me. Um, I'll just say user. Or I'll say console input. Console to be a little bit more specific from this context console input gets that console input there that's fair oh save it f5 to run it 5 plus 65 we have operator missing two required positional arguments on so Python's the opposite of most other programming languages. You start at the bottom line, which would have been nice if every programming language did that in the past. <laughs> so, but yeah, your most relevant lines down here. So we're missing two required positional arguments, op and num b. And then if we start scanning back up, we can see line 41. So if we go back over here, um, line 41 is the line we're actually on. So operate console input. So if we come back up here, we can see that we still were expecting our three so-called primitive values instead of our console input um, dictionary. Maybe I should name that plural too, just to kind of make sure. So we're going to pass that in. We're going to pass a dictionary in here. Um, we'll just call it inputs when it's in here. And so we can basically go in inputs dot not dot I don't think that will work in Python that would probably work in JavaScript so basically we're gonna have to prefix them with this so I'll come down here and do that real quick and that's another good thing I'm already sensing that I'm really not doing this is <laughs> quite as clean as I should not quite fitting my finger on why, but when I'm doing this much cutting and pasting and stuff, then okay, I'm going to undo all this. And right here, I'm just going to break it apart. That seems like the easiest thing to do. So we'll say that op, this local variable op equals inputs op and then we'll say that uh, what do we have num a equals inputs num a so it may seem a little bit redundant but if you just think about how this at like any sort of scale you know on anything realistically more complex than this and this will eventually get more complex, so to take care of this when it seems simple is the best idea. I'm going to save that and run it. 5 plus... Oh, what happened there? Let me run that one more time. I wasn't paying attention. 5 or whatever. Plus. Okay. So it just didn't loop, but that seems to be working. So that's good. That was a lot less typing, and then if we do decide, like, hey, you know what, this whole inputs dictionary wasn't the right thing or whatever, we can just change it all, like, within that area and without having to change too much. So 
once you get a little bit more in practice, if you're getting that feeling like I was where I'm going down, I'm like copy, paste, 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 paste. It's like, whoa, that's like, that's wet. That's, we enjoy typing. That's not dry. Don't repeat yourself. So that wasn't the unsettling feeling that got me to correct that. So let's see, we have two reason, too many reasons to change, um, too wet, not dry with the print format statements, not build with TDD. Okay, let's do a comb through from the top down, left to right, and see what we got. So we got our initialization at the top, that's good. We have the function definitions above the main code. That's what we want. This one operates on the inputs. That makes sense. Then we get down here, and this is another function definition, which is um, getting console input, which reads, I think we understand what that does. It's going to get all the results into a dictionary. Um, there's the result of number one and the result of the operator adding that result and then returning the results. Okay, that all fairly whatever. And then right here, this is our main code again. So um, this is sort of the high level driver. And now if you see what's right here, this is like the high level driver. This would be the manual test code. So what I'm actually going to do now is this is a thing in Python. Um, you say if name. So the name, any of these double underscore preceded and postfixed with the double underscore methods are called dunder methods. They're special methods. Um, you shouldn't just go around like creating your own willy nilly. They basically have a meaning within the system. So the name is the name of this module, like sort of like the contextual name of this module. So we're going to say if that name of that module compares to um, another special value main, then go ahead and run that code and I'll save that. So if we run it again right now, we can see Dave 30. So that's working. Um, and we bounce back over here. Everything's still working the same. All this does is you can, I shouldn't even do that yet. But anyway, <laughs> what that does, that I did that kind of like jump the gun a little bit to say that this is the manual testing code, this console input. There's 99.9999% chance our users aren't going to be using uh, the console for input. We're using it as just sort of a lowest common denominator to be able to like get our stuff working without we're keeping it separate from any fancy sort of user interface any uh, desirable interface that way we're not bound to that interface we don't accidentally write some of the logic in those controls for like how to uh, to do any of these calculations because those calculations we want to be separate you know if we want to write an accounting program a year from now if we can reuse those calculations in it, that would even be better. So, um, yeah, so me jumping the gun with that was just to say, hey, if we call this module in this sense, like from the console, this module directly, then invoke this console-based input and output and stuff right here. But for now, we'll just leave it. I mean, it's just going to do that. We're not going to import this, and that's sort of Python-specific. But anyway... Um, too many reasons to change so we just went over that reason to change we realized that will have to change um, that's not a huge deal this if I mean it's not too many reasons at this point it only changes if um, no matter what it's called get console input we know this is centered around getting the console the only reason to have to change is if we don't want to get a float anymore which is understandable that to be totally clean that shouldn't be in there we really just want to get the input and then whether or not you know how we want to format it later maybe would be separate but that's only if we keep re coming to this problem if we keep coming in here and going, you know what it'd be nice if float was out of here if we truly think that we're not just nitpicking for no reason um, if we do that multiple times and it's like hey that's that's your flag that's your signal saying hey get float out of there um, make this do one thing and do one thing well make it just get the user input at the console just like it says it doesn't say anything about like float or not but for now this works and you know what for the rest of this program's existence that might work we don't know but for now we're keeping it simple we're leaving it there so too many reasons to change the precision the precision only changes up here so we can get rid of that 
that's only one place. It might not be the best option 10 years from now, but for now it is the best option. Um, if there's a GUI, now the GUI, here's the other cool thing. If we plug in, you know, if you think of that external calculator, like at least just the digit control pad, maybe not even the output yet, um, it can call this operate function now and it can pass it the inputs. Just like when we tested that calculator function on the first video and we go like eight plus nine equals 17, you know? So when we hit equals on a graphical one, it could just automatically call this function as a command and pass it those values in the object. And it's like, wow. So that's, and not only that, now this is separate so we can also test it. We can write a test driven development style test, a unit test for it. Um, it's not test driven because we didn't write the test first, which would drive the development. This, um, but technically we are testing. I mean, like this right here, I, my argument is that all all development is test driven. Um, it's either user test driven or it's automated test driven. And user test driven is really flaky. As you can see, like, I don't know if you've noticed it, but every time I run this, I'm always like, oh, you know, like, I can't even think of it. Like, should I do 5.5? And then should I do divided by 6.0? You know, like, what should I do? I don't even know. So the cool thing with um, writing tests is that you sort of think like, what is significant? Okay, last video we talked about how 0 0.1 plus 0.2, um, those types of calculations can be significant. Certain floating point, especially calculations or overflow, underflow calculations can reveal problems in the, you know, and maybe even just the display, if not even the accuracy of something. So anything like that, if you just stop and think for a second, and you're like, you know what, I, I want to make sure that those the little floating point calculations that catch those weird floating point errors, I want to run all those and make sure they're formatted and they don't have that error. Write a test for those. You know what I mean? Um, of course, if coming from the simple perspective, unless you've done test-driven development before, you're like, what? So don't even worry about it. Um, the fact is, is that this code right here can get swapped out. This is the um let's see what we have here let's break it down we got our it's just our initialization this is our processing as far as our business level processing so to speak this is our input this is our output right there so we have our our input processing and output and then right here this is calling our input but this that in a nutshell is our our main entry point of our program right there that's the first line of code that's going to execute that we're actually it's going to kick off something that we're going to see and that right there is representative of potentially so much more code you know that's the driver of this program right here so um that would be like this would be main main entry point that's right there and then right here is output and these are just informal comments just to sort of like label where we're at what we're seeing right now reinforcing that idea is so we have initialization inputs defined outputs defined the main entry point is first run and executed which kicks off that back up to that input part at the top so you could even think of that as just executing first and then it stores that result the console inputs um, will become a dictionary and based on the return value of that call which we'll call this and it will ask the user for that and then it will finally it will output it right there and we'll double check we didn't introduce any errors with another manual test and Okay.
And to be more thorough, you would want to check that with like hand or pocket calculator or whatever, like check it by hand or with pocket calculator. So now that covers, that doesn't, nothing really has, if you look, this main entry point has a reason to change if we change like platforms, if we change devices, um, then, you know, if we don't have a console anymore, that would be sort of like the front end platform, I guess you could say. And then if you change like right here, this thing, um, if we change to like a graphical user interface, we might want to change that to a display, like I mentioned in the last video. But anyway, we're we're inching towards that. We're now getting to the point where we can replace this. What we can do is we can end up extracting this out into a whole nother function, which is called like display. And then we, when we go into that display function, that will decide at whatever point, or you know, basically decide there it will fork based on some decision, maybe a global constant, symbolic constant, just like we had up here. Maybe we could have one like GUI equals true or something up there, you know, in the future when we, the near future when we add this GUI capability in here. Um, but for now, it's it's separated. It's pushed over. It's still smelly. But the smells pushed over. Sandy Metz says, hide the mess. And that's when I like to think of it like that. Like, we're just constantly, like, pushing that mess, like, arm's length away. And then after it sits arm's length away for a couple iterations, if it's still a mess, then we can deal with it then. Like, if we need to, you know, if it's still in our way. Maybe that means pushing it out and abstracting it further without really even fixing it. Or whatever. So, any re anyway... Um, we've kind of started to address the too many reasons to change things. So I'm going to delete that. And then the too wet, not, or yeah, too wet, not dry with the print and formats. We've, we've fixed that. I mean, there's no, there's no formatting. The formatting has been pushed up here and the printing, that's all results now there. So there's only one print. So we've gotten rid of all that issue not built with TDD, error prone manual testing. So that's still an issue, but that's another thing that I'm going to leave that in there for now. That's another thing that we've worked towards by extracting these, you know, our primary functionality, our business functionality and other functionality too, but especially that. And it's all accessible. Like we can get, we can get directly to it. We can come right into each one of these things and we can say hey we want to start operating we don't want to have to go through like a console interface and all this weird stuff we want to go just straight to the operator and right as soon as we're done operating right here right at the end of the operation we want that result and we can do that and so that block that chunk of code is now has an in and an out it has an entrance and an exit now so that's one thing if you have that monolithic procedural just pages of code if you don't take each one of these like conceptual deals and put it separate you can't isolate it and test it in isolation and your the reusability is not there and it just leads to compounding problems so um, okay so let's go down here the init section with the globals we got that we got the input section processing and output. I didn't even have to go over those, so I'll save all this, run it one more time. We'll add some number, minus some other number. Oh, and the reason it's doing that is without the decimal, which was surprising to me, is there's three, six, seven, eight digits, which is like our thing. So it can't. It that uh, formatter told it not to do that, so that's something where, if we wanted, we could change this to like 80 digits without any extra zeros. Save it, F5 it, and then I'll just do the same copy that value, paste it in there, do the minus, copy this value, paste it in here, and then you can see there's the decimal because I told it do up to 80 decimal places without any extra zeros. And then I don't, I think um, if we do an F, it's the same thing, but add the padded zeros. 
So let's um, run that. Oop. I didn't see what that said. Okay, so control C, control V, inner, minus inner, control C, control V. Oh yeah, there's all the extra zeros. So only on the right hand side of the decimal does it do the extra zeros. So I'm going to put that back, save it again. And technically I should test it again, but I'm sick of testing. Um, and my tests aren't even thorough, you know? So it's just, that's why test-driven development is the next step from here. It's the next logical step. And also the user interface will plug right in. They both will go hand in hand. I think I can shut up now. Um, I'm just like double checking that, yeah. So we've split up that same program. This is all been refactoring. Okay, I didn't loop it. I did not loop it. So just to make it identical functionality with the last one, we'll do while true. Oh, what's going on there? Okay, save F5, five plus five, okay, 10. And then control C to break out of that, tab back over, what's up with our formatter? I still have it on the F, I need to put it back on G. So there's a good reason why test, we want to have those tests run in between. What if I got lazy and didn't run that test? You know, so save, F5 to run, five plus five, 10, and then it's looping three plus 3.33333. Okay, control C, I'm gonna do an alt F4. Okay, so anyway, maybe for real a I'm thinking like a graphical uh, input, so maybe just the numeric part, um, these basic operators and the modulo, and then like an equals, and that's it. None of these extra buttons, none of this uh, display, and that will kind of help us keep the input separate from the output. Even though for now they can be in the same place, uh, it's not a huge deal that they're completely separate. A lot of times they go hand in hand with stuff, at least to whatever degree. Um, but yeah, just to kind of demonstrate that, I just, I don't want to hang up yet. I'm worried that like, what if I don't have it all covered? But I think that just, that keeps it simple in this context right here. That's really, I mean, arguably maybe could have gone a couple other places. If you can think of anything, what would you have done different? Let me know. Please let me know. Um, I'd like to consider it. I don't think there's any wrong answers, you know, even if you're like, you know what, I jump straight to whatever bloated junk, like there, you might think you have a reason I would like to contest it but um, you know unless you've gone through this experience right here I just don't think any extra complexity justifies it because we could be done like I said this program could be thrown out like this whole project it's like you know what there's too many calculators out there whatever um, at any point along the way so like I said I'll shut up now and I'm looking forward to like improving this Thank you very much.